today we go again back into the letters of John. In the first letter today, we have come to chapter 2, verse 12 to 14. And uh, my title there is Living in Maturity, or rather it should be, I should have said it, Growing in Maturity. John has come at a time, a place where he had to stop for a while and see what he is writing. So he goes back and gives us this small capsule of these verses which are very odd in between. They don't match with the first, neither they match with the following passage. But yet he's asking us to grow in maturity, live a life of maturity, live in maturity. So the reason I said live in maturity is I've been writing to you, I've been speaking on living, 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 and I think that is how I came across with the phrase, live in maturity. And uh, when it comes to growth in life, when it comes to uh, motivation to do something better than what I have been doing so far, I think it is the German poet Johannan Goethe who said, Correction does much, but encouragement does more. Correction does much, but encouragement does more. And he's the one who is also believed to have said that the way you see people is the way you treat them, and the way you treat them is what they become. The way you see people is the way you treat them. If you respect someone, you already have made some kind of judgment that you think the person is worthy of respect. And then as you begin to respect that person, you see that person also developing in a respectable personality. But if you have already judged a person not worthy of your respect and you begin to disrespect that person, and as a result of your disrespect towards the person, he or she grows into that kind of a person who does not become respectable in your eyes. Do unto others what you want them to do to you. So in that line, I read a story of a retired school teacher in Arizona. In her class, she had this habit of, or rather she had this ritual of giving a particular assignment to her class either in the middle of the season, uh, semester or the end, I don't remember, but she used to tell the students to take two pieces of paper, write the names of students, and then write all the good things they think about or they see in the other person's life. So the students will take the sheet of paper, list the name and the good qualities in that student's life. Then she will take the paper, go home, and then she will tally all the good things that the friends are writing about each other and on the first class then she will hand over each person this list of good qualities described by their friends. Many years later, one of her students was killed in Vietnam and she goes to attend his funeral. As they were just jostling around in, after the funerals and having the time to share and talk to each other, the father walks up to the teacher and said, Ma'am, I'm so glad you taught my child. When he died, he had this list with him. And he gives to the teacher the list that she had compiled of all the good things his friends had said in the class. And he was carrying that list all the way to Vietnam. And as the news spreads out that he was keeping a list from his middle school all the way to Vietnam War, some of his classmates also were there attending the funeral, and they sheepishly come and said, Miss, actually, I still have that list in my front desk. And some other guy says, I still have it in my pocket. And the other guy says, I still have it in my wedding album. Because those good words written by friends and the peers or classmates meant a lot to these young men and women too who grew up and became men and women who went all the way to Vietnam to fight for their country. But yet the words written by their classmates when they were in the middle school still meant a lot. The 
you're beautiful, you're handsome, you're kind, you're helpful, you did a wonderful job, you did help to me in this way and that way. So therefore, Goethe's word, correction does much, but encouragement does more. I wish I had known that earlier in my life. So when I began a Christian walk and started my ministry, I was known to be a very rebuking pastor. So later in life, I had, I had to work hard to temper and to realize that, no, 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 actually I am the immature one, not my members. Because when you see a judgmental attitude in a person's talk or teaching or any other instruction he or she gives, you will realize that the person is not mature enough. He has not lived enough years. Whenever you hear a pastor or a preacher with a judgmental attitude, whenever you come across with a person who talks in that kind of a tone, you know that this person has not learned or not yet matured. Because if you're matured in Christ, then instead of judging others, you will begin to encourage others. You will begin to lift them up. When someone comes with the terrible problems, instead of telling how terrible and awful you are, you would say, my friend, that's not a big deal. Why don't you just look up to God who has done much more than what you can think or imagine. He can change your mistakes. He can change your sinful behaviors. He can change your weaknesses into something that you can never imagine. They will give you more advice in order to grow, in not in order to condemn or correct you. So here, John is very strong in many cases up to now. He said, if you say, I love, but you hate, then you are not a Christian. If you say, I walk in the light, but you don't love your brother, you are still in darkness. In fact, you belong to the evil one. If you hate someone, he said, you are not a Christian. Then all of a sudden, he waits here. He, he pauses here, and he realizes his... Uh, words may have been a little hard for the members to digest. And he gives them their true identity. One more, he assures them that, okay, I'm writing this, line, this letter to you, but the fact of the matter is, you are who you are. It does not change by anything you do or you don't do, because God has called you, God has saved you, God has forgiven you, God has made you His own, He has sealed you by the power of His Holy Spirit. So I want you to be reassured of who you are in Christ. So let me read what he said here. First John chapter 2, verse 12 to 14, he said, I am writing to you, dear children, you, the word dear is not there in the original text, but because John is a loving disciple, maybe the English translators want to put his emphasis here. He said, I'm writing to you children. And the word children here has to do something with relationship. Like uh, a father who has a 60 years old son is still a child to him. So that, that's, the, that's the word here the child in relation to what he is or she is to the father or to the parent. So, I'm writing to you, my children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, now young men, not necessarily men in sense, but young ladies too, okay? <laughs> so, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Then he is going to repeat it again, the same thing with slight modification in chapter four, uh, verse 14. He said, I write to you, dear children. Now, that is a different word again. The dear children here is not in terms of relationship, but in terms of chronology, in terms of your age. This is literally the children, the little gro children that are just growing about. So in English, we don't see the difference, but in the original language, you will see the first word for children was in terms of relationship. The second word in verse 14 is in terms of age. Applying that to our spirituality, it would be new believers. Immature believers, if it is a word like that. So he said, I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. Now see the difference uh, 
though repetition, but in chapter verse 13 he said, I write to you children because your sins have been forgiven for his name's sake. And in 14 he said, I write to you dear children because you know the Father. And then he said, I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. There is no change for that. And then he said, I write to you young men because you are strong. First time he said, you overcame the evil one. But now he said, how did you overcome the evil one? Because you are strong. Then he said, and the word of God lives in you. That means, how are you strong? Because the word of God lives in you. And therefore you have overcome the evil one. So that's a very strange way of putting this kind of passage in the middle of a letter. He is writing about how to live a Christian life. And he stops here and says, I write to you children, I write to you fathers, and I write to you young men. There are three groups of people he is addressing, as though he is addressing these three groups. But in reality, he is writing this letter to a church. So therefore, we can deduce from this kind of a writing that he is writing in terms of our spiritual growth. Some children, the first uh, children in verse 12 is a common word that he will use when he addresses the whole church. That word, my children, is in terms of relationship. In chapter 1 and then later in chapter 3 and 4 he's going to use that same word implying that that's a relationship, my dear children. Of course, he's an old man by this time. And by age-wise also, he is able to call them my children. Spiritually, he has given them spiritual birth. And Paul also says that he has given birth to many, many spiritual sons and daughters. And in many places, Paul says, you ought to be fathers by now, but you're still children. You're infant. So, first of all, he says... I write to you, my children, and the first children in verse 12 has to do with his address to all Christians. Regardless of your age, regardless of your spiritual maturity. You are all children for John and taking that back to God and we all are the children of God. God is our father. So in that terms, when he says that you are my children, I'm writing to you. This letter is for you. Why? Why do I write? Because, the word there, because your sins have been forgiven. To the first children, in terms of relationship, whether you're old or young, whether you're spiritually mature or immature, whether you're a new believer or an old believer, he says, I'm writing this because your sins have been forgiven. That's a powerful statement. He's not saying your sins will be forgiven. You're not saying, he's not saying your sins are being forgiven. They have been forgiven once and for all. When you accepted Jesus as your personal savior, at that point, something eternal has happened. At that point, when Jesus Christ comes in your heart as the Logos, a life-giving word that we saw in chapter 1. The life-giving word that entered your heart created you into a new image. And he took away all your sins once and for all. Your sins have been forgiven. Yes, uh, he said, if you hate someone, you are in the darkness. If you walk in the darkness, then you don't know the Father and you don't belong to Him. Yes, there are times we will get angry and upset. Yes, there are times we will be very mad at each other. We may hate at times, but that does not define our existence. Our existence as Christian is that we are forgiven people. We are cleansed people. We are made holy. We are created in the image of Christ. So he said, I want you to understand that I'm writing to you. I want you to grow in your spirituality. I want you to be loving, kind and compassionate. But that does not mean that if you fail at one time or the other, it doesn't mean 
you lose everything. No, your sins have been forgiven. You're cleansed. And therefore in chapter 1 verse 9 he says, If you confess your sins, he is just and faithful to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Not only that, he said, the, your sins have been forgiven. How? For his name's sake. In NIV he says, you have been forgiven on account of his name, because of his name or for his name. That's a little difficult to translate. Some commentator would tell you, he is simply telling that because of the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and that is very true. But taking back this idea of the name of God and God doing something for the name of sake of His name goes all the way back to Moses, for example. Moses in Numbers chapter 14, and then Ezekiel expounds that passage in Ezekiel 20, and he, there he, God wanted to destroy the people of Israel when they rebelled in the wilderness. God said to Moses, Moses, I've had enough of these people. I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to kill them. And then out of you, I will make a new nation. But then Moses goes to God and says, Lord, what are you saying? If you do that, what will the people who hear about you will say? Then Ezekiel says, because of the name of God, he did not destroy them in the wilderness. Because of the holiness of the name of God, to protect his own name, he did not destroy the rebellion in wilderness. Moses also appeals to God and says, Lord, for your name's sake, don't do this. And then God listens to Moses. That's an amazing chapter in itself. So Moses said, for your name's sake. Forgive our sins. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, we see the people of Israel are now back in the promised land. Samuel is an old prophet and judge and priest. His sons are not doing well. And the people began to ask for a king. Samuel's heart was broken. God says, go and give it away anyway. They are not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. Then Samuel goes and gives them the king. And he tells them this warning and he said, If your king and you people rebel against God, God will reject. But for his name's sake, he will reject the king, but will forgive you. He will save you. God will save his people for his name's sake, even though he will reject the king. And that one, that's what happened in the life of Saul. Jeremiah says the same thing in chapter 14. He said, Lord, please don't nullify the covenant with your people. Yes, we are wicked, we are unrighteous, we are rebellious. But for your name's sake, O God, do not cancel the covenant. If you do that, we are done, we are finished, we have nothing. And what will happen to your name, that awesome, glorious, powerful name? So this is how John is also reminding the believers in his church that your sins have been forgiven, not because you are righteous, so you are moral, you are did great things, but because of his own name's sake. God will do whatever he does for sake of his own name and for the sake of his own pleasure and his purpose. So forgiveness of our sins is also for his own namesake, for his glory. He has created us in his image. He has redeemed us today by his son's blood. It is all because of his name's sake. To make that crystal clear, clear, let's read Ezekiel chapter 36. If Sidney can post it there, you will join with me. That's a long passage, but beautifully describes the, the, the desire for God to save his name. And in doing so, he is saving his people. Let us read Ezekiel chapter 
36 verse 22 onward. Let me read for you. Therefore say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. In other words, you have brought my name in disrepute, but I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to do such a new thing that will bring glory back to my name. What is he going to do? Verse 24 onward. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and a new, put a new spirit in you. And I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my command. That's a powerful, powerful covenant making God promising in the last day. He's going to take away the disobedient and the rebellious heart. He's going to take away the stony heart. He's going to take away the sinful heart. He's going to take away the sin loving heart. And he's going to give us a new heart. Put a new spirit within us. So that that new heart and that new spirit will long to obey God. So that's what John is here telling. Because of the name of Jesus, he has given you a new heart. He has given you a new spirit and you long to obey him. Yes, at times you may rebel against God. At times you may fall in sin. But that doesn't characterize your heart anymore. Now, you have a new heart. You have a new spirit. You have a new identity as a child of God. And therefore you long to satisfy your father's heart. You long to please your father's heart because your whole creation is new. 28. Then you will live in the land I give your ancestors. You have to understand that when Old Testament prophets speak, they have an immediate context. The people of Israel and the geography and the location. But the prophetic message transcends their limitations. It has many, many layers of meaning behind those prophetic utterances. So now see, once God does this kind of surgical work in our life to remove the old heart and give a new heart, our lives begin to demonstrate new qualities. How? Then you will live in the land and I'll give your ancestors I gave you ancestor. You will be my people and I'll be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and make it plentiful and will bring forth fam uh, will not bring famine upon you. I will increase the fruit of the trees and the crops of the field so that you will no longer suffer disgrace among the nations because of famine. Then you will remember your evil ways and wicked deeds and you will loathe yourself for your sins and detestable practices. I want you to know that I am not doing this for your sake, declares the sovereign Lord. Be ashamed and be and disgrace for your conduct, conduct people of Israel. So the point is, I'm going to love you in such a way, I'm going to forgive all your sins. I'm going to cleanse you so perfectly, so purifying way, that every time you remember your sins, you're going to kill yourself in the world. You're going to pluck out your hair and say, what, what was I thinking? That I could do such a thing against the name of God. How could I live the life that I lived? Because now you see the newness of creation. Now you see the beauty of life in Jesus Christ as a child of God. That no matter where you go, there is this amazing grace of God coming and surrounding you. Even though you walk into a famine ravaged land, you still begin to reap a plentiful harvest. You go to a land that is desolate and destroyed and you bring life into it. You go into the area where there is all kind of wickedness and evil and you bring good and moral uprightness into that place because you have been given a new heart and a new spirit. You have a new identity as a child of God who is covered by this merciful God who follows after you, who chases after you and every time you make mistake, he covers it up. 
He said, I'm going to cover your uncleanness. I'm going to run after you to wipe away all the dirt that you tried to create behind you. And when you look back and you're going to say, how could I do such a thing? Oh God, have mercy on me. And you will loathe yourself. You will repent from your sins. And that's what John said. When you repent, he's just and faithful in forgiving your sin and then wiping away all the dark spots that you will have in your life by indulging in sinful behaviors. So that's the kind of namesake for his own namesake. What kind of God we serve? We serve a God who is loving. We serve a God who is compassionate. We serve a God who is a creator and the sustainer of the universe. I think it was on Monday Bible studies we were discussing. Look at the lifelessness of the universe. The galaxies, maybe 30, 40 years ago, we still have some hope that there would be life somewhere out there. But the more we begin to know about the space, the less chances there are that there would be a life in them. The universe is a lifeless mass of matter. The earth and the moon and the Mars appear to be made of similar kind of matters. Even the asteroid that passed by, the meteorite that fall on earth, they happen to be similar kind of materials. But only on this little tiny speck of dust there should be life and nothing in the vast universe. But the thing is, I believe when Jesus Christ finally restores his kingdom. We're going to see life in galaxies. The lifeless universe will come to life. The beauty of God's creation, we have no idea. We can't even fathom or imagine what the next creation will be. So when Jesus came to make you his child, it's not just a small little mission he was involved in, this little tiny planet called Earth. No, God has a universal plan. A cosmic plan to restore his creation from the power of sin. From the destruction that came upon this universe because of sin. He's going to reverse it completely. And therefore, he's doing it for his own namesake. He's the God who created the universe. And he's a God who is able to restore this universe. He's the God who created you. And therefore, he's able to restore you back into his image. You may think that, oh, I am sinful, I am awful, I cannot live a holy life, I am done, I cannot live anymore this way, I am so ashamed to go to God. You may have had that kind of feeling, but no, God is not finished with you. He is running after you to cleanse you from all your ugliness, your filth, your dirt. He does it by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So he said that kind of children we are. We are what kind of children of God? We are the children of God that are forgiven from all our sins. How? Because of the name of Jesus. Matthew 1, 21, the name of Jesus means Joshua, which means the Lord saves. And then Romans chapter 10, verse 13, Paul says, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone who calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. So he said, I am writing to you, my children, that you have been forgiven for his name's sake. You have a relationship with God, your Father, that is never going to be broken again. Nothing will ever break that relationship. Not your righteousness, not your unrighteousness. It is sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then the second verse 14, I'm writing to you my children, that is age group there. The, the sense of maturity or immaturity. So they are surely new people in the church. And he says, I write to you little children, new believers, because you know the Father. The first children, they know the Father because their sins have been forgiven. They have restored their relationship. But to the new believers, he said, I write to you because you know the Father. How do we know the Father? Romans, according to Paul, Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know the Father. When you come to Christ, 
and place your trust in him, you have peace with God. In other words, you know the Father. Now he has made you his own child. You have become God's child. You know, when I was born, my father was told that if he sees me, he's going to die. Therefore, he never saw me until I was 11 years old. And I never saw my father until then. Then my son was born. When the nurses brought, uh, still not so clean, wrapped around the clo hospital clothes, and said, you have a photocopy of you. <laughs> and at that time, when the nurse was coming towards me to give me my son, a thought came to me, suppose this was my father, what we would have thought? Suppose the nurse says, you have a son, but if you see him, you're going to die. Would you like to see him still? And I say, I would still tell this nurse, yes, all, all my heart, even if I have to die, let me die by looking at my son's face. That was what in my mind at that time when the nurse was giving my son to me for the first time. As a human being, how, how exciting it was, how amazing it was that I have a son then if the nurse says that you're going to die after having a glimpse of your son, I was willing to die. But suppose my son never grew up. Suppose my son remained infant in the body, in mind. What will happen to me? After 20, 30, 40 years, he never grew he knows me as a father, I know him as my son. But if that child does not grow, it's a heartache in the family. It's a loss for that child, a loss of life, missing on so many opportunities, what he could have been, what he would be. So when John is telling them, I write to you, New believers, because you know the Father, he's hinting to them, say, I'm writing all this so that you will grow. So that you begin to increase your intimacy with your Father and begin to enjoy the life he has created for you. If you don't grow, you remain spiritually dwarf, then you're going to miss a lot in life. You will know the Father, of course, but then you going to miss a lot in life because if you don't take time to grow. So Peter said this way, therefore, First Peter chapter 2 verse 1, he said, therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander of every kind, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Crave for spiritual milk, which is the word of God. Crave like a newborn baby for the spiritual milk so that you may grow in your salvation. So what John is saying, I'm writing to you, my new beloved, new believers, so that you will grow in your salvation. You will grow in maturity. You will develop a Christian character. You will develop a Christian mind. You will develop a Christian uh, atmosphere in your family, in your workplaces, when people see you, they'll see a man and a woman who is seasoned by the knowledge of God, by the knowledge of the Father. So I've taken quite a long time. Quickly, he says, I write to the Father, secondly. Firstly, he says, I write to the children. What kind of children? First, in terms of relationship, all believers, whether you're young or old, you have been forgiven from your, your sins because God has done it for his own namesake. He loves you so much, he has completely forever, once and for all, forgiven your sins. Secondly, he says, you grow, my children. Crave for spiritual milk. And experience the depth of relationship with God. Then he comes to say, I write to you, fathers. He said, because you have known the one who is from the beginning. That's a very strange way of putting it. What does it mean? I write to you, he doesn't change in second verse also, he says, I write to you fathers because you've known the one who is from the beginning. 
he does not go from a logical sequence that children, young people and father should be the right thing, but he said children, father and then young people. So he is putting the fathers in, bit, in, in between as if to catch the children on the one side and the young people on the other side and maintain the spiritual growth steadily. How could they do? Because they have known the one who is from the beginning. Which implies that they have had a long experience. They are seasoned, they are fathers, spiritually they are mature people because they have lived long with God. And as you live long in Christ, you're going to know that even though you made mistakes, you fall down, you are not the perfect person, but the Heavenly Father never rejected you. Only in your deep spiritual walk with God, in a long spiritual walk with God, you come to a place where you realize that God loves me anyway. So you stop correcting yourself for God to love you more. You stop working hard to earn God's love. You stop yourself perfecting yourself in terms of morality or any other good works so that God would love you. You come to a place where you say, God loves me anyway. Yes, maybe this morning I fought with my wife. Okay, I'm not telling I fought, but suppose I fought with my wife. I have to say, or I must be able to say, God loves me anyway. Suppose you did something terrible to your friend. You come to a place and says, yes, I'm a bad guy, I'm a bad person, but God loves me anyway. Suppose your life is marked with some character flaws, you want to change but you can't, but you come to a stage in life, if you walk enough time with God, you'll say, God loves me anyway. I know the one who has been from the beginning, from the day I believed in him, from the, uh, the, the day I made mistakes, the day I blew away everything in my life, the day I brought shame and disgrace to his name, but he still loves me anyway. So that's why he calls them spiritual fathers who have had this deep spiritual experience of the love of God. So I'm not telling that we should live in sin or allow all kind of immoral behavior, no. The point is, you can never earn more love of God by being a good person because God has already loved you more than what you can think or imagine. His love is complete, perfected. He's not going to love you more by being good. He's not going to love you less by being bad. He loves you. And that experience will only come when you walk with Him in your good days and in your bad days. If you're walking with God only in your good days and running away from Him in the bad days, then you don't know God. So you walk, these fathers have walked with God in their good days and in their bad days and therefore they can handle the young people, children also, and they will be able to handle the young people also and will be able to provide them some kind of spiritual mentoring to those who want to develop in life. So quickly let me run through as my time is running out. He says, thirdly, he says, I write to you young men and women too. He said, you have overcome the evil one. The young men would correspond with the member who has believed in Christ and he's developing, he's progressing in terms of spirituality. He's overcoming. This person is a newly born again believer but has done some kind of progress in life. He's progressed, he's done his spiritual discipline and he's reading the Bible, praying, he's filled with passion and compassion, he's filled with zeal and vitality. Therefore, he said, you have overcome the evil one. How did you overcome evil one? He will say, you are strong. Not physical strength. It is a spiritual strength. How do you get the spiritual strength? He said, the word of God abides in you. So he said, I'm writing to you young people because you're strong. Because the word of God lives in you. And therefore, you have overcome the evil one. So in other words, he said, continue to do so. 
I'm writing to you these things so that you continue to do so. You remain strong spiritually. How do you remain strong spiritually? Remain in the word of God. When you remain in the word of God, that is going to give you the spiritual vitality to overcome the evil one, whatever that may be. So for the children, for the fathers and for the young people, the only resource or the only vitality, uh, the, the vitamin that you will have is from the word of God. How can you grow in maturity? By word of God. If the word of God lives in you, it will grow your spiritual life. It will grow you into a strong person who is able to overcome the temptation of the evil one, who is over, able to overcome some of the character flaws in life, who is able to overcome difficulties and challenges and hardship in life, because the word of God is in you. I cannot overemphasize the value of reading the Bible and memorizing the Bible and believing the Bible and putting that Bible into practice. I was watching Oprah Winfrey show and uh, they were making some kind of jokes and the three ladies were sitting in front and they were enjoying the joke. And there was Simon Cowell also in with uh, Winfrey and said, one of the ladies said, you look very flirty. And she said, how could you say so? I'm a Bible teacher. And the Oprah said, you're a Bible teacher? And then they had back and forth and said, if you're a Bible teacher, can you tell me the names of the Bible? I mean, the books of the Bible. And she said, Matthew, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and it was an embarrassing moment for that lady to have said, I'm a Bible teacher and I don't know the names of the books in the Bible. The point is, studying, uh, joining a Bible study or joining a Bible study group or leading a Bible study group is a very good thing in itself. But we need to have the Word of God in us in such a way that we can allow this Word to grow. Unless you have the Word in your heart, unless you know what is this word about, unless you put your faith and trust in that word, it's not going to grow. Thus, attending a Bible study is not going to change your life. It may change your mind, you may have knowledge. But if the word of God has to change your life, then you have to allow the word of God to remain in you. And then you have to meditate upon that word and allow that word to flourish. And then your words have to be in line with what the word says your thinking has to be in line with what the word says and then it will help you to put your behaviors in the same line so what John is telling I'm writing to you young people who are very strong because you have the word of God in you and therefore you have overcome the evil one and continue to do so continue to grow in maturity by putting the word in your heart in your mind by meditating upon that word by believing upon that word and saying it is written whenever there is a time to challenge your faith. Say it is written, it is written. So with that let me close here and let's go to our communion table today.